So this session we're going to be looking at two surahs. The first one is Surah Ruth, and the other one is Surah Yusuf. Now, as I said, that these three surahs, Surah Yunus, Ruth, and Yusuf, were un are unique because they are all named after the names of the prophets. And they all came, not just in order of revelation, but also were revealed consecutively. So they don't come just in the Mus'haf, one after the other, uh, chapter 10, 11, 12. They're also revealed in consecutive order in the later uh, Muffin period. And they were revealed at a time when the difficulties of the believers had reached its uh, summit. And they needed some guidance and some hope. So as was alluded to in the previous session, Surah Yunus, Surah Yunus and Surah Thur they have two quite different messages. Surah so Yunus gives the people a chance to go to the Quraysh and the people to go back and return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without facing the punishment. But Surah Hud is quite the opposite. Where a number of stories come mentioning the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the people. And for this reason, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was asked by Abu Bakr, that what's happened to you? What's happened to you? You suddenly, and this actually showed us something very interesting. Abu Bakr radiallahu realized within a space of a short period, the Prophet sallallahu hair turned gray. And this was very noticeable to him. So just by reading this, the verses within the surah, the Prophet ﷺ had aged. His hair had turned away. So this surah, as I've mentioned, is a Makki surah. It came after Surah Yunus and it consists of 123 verses under these circumstances. This was the most, the dark, darkest, most difficult time during the period and the mission of the Messenger of Allah Allah wa sallam. Ten years he'd been calling his people to Tawheed, inviting them to Allah. And then he lost his shelter, his two main shelters, his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, and also his uncle Abu Qaris. And he wanted to look for a new area, a new base, a new place where he and his companions could practice Islam. And he decided to go to Bahir. But rather than this being a place where he could settle, that ended up being one of the most difficult parts, periods within his lifetime. For even, not only did they drive him out of the city of Fahid, but they even, the children and the lowly of society, the low of society, were throwing stones and rocks upon the Messenger of Allah until he started to bleed. So these three surahs, they came to him to give him comfort, to give him ease. So 
So this surah is the other side of surah, surah Yunus. And we know that humans living under such pressure as did his companions where they were tortured and persecuted to the extent that some of them prior to this had left to another area of Abyssinia which is today Ethiopia to live a decent life. That's how bad it got. They had to migrate to another area of the world. So under these circumstances, there are three things that can happen to the believers in Makkah. The first thing, well let me tell let me ask this to everyone else. What, what do you think would happen to people in these situations? And I'm not talking about the companions in Makkah only, but just generally. What would happen? Uh, no, what is their response? Yes, the torture is happening to them. What will be the response of people who are being tortured and are being treated in this manner? What will happen to such people? No, no, they are oppressed, but what would their reaction be? Sorry? They will fight. This is one possibility. They will lash out and they will become violent. Because this is their only way out. Yeah. What's another possibility? They will kill you. They would give up their faith, they would lose hope, yeah? Or another possibility. They might feel inferior. They might feel inferior, yeah, that's possible. That, that, uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, they may be patient, uh, that's, a, that's a possibility here. Migration. Migration is a possibility. Another thing, and I'm not sure that. Maybe it will come under what the brother mentioned. Is that they may, you know, the, the saying that they, they have here is that if you can't beat them, you join them. So this is a real possibility. So we can say that anyone who is under these circumstances will fa may face three main, uh, they may be faced with three possibilities. The first one is that they will lose hope. They will lose sight of those things that they considered to be important. The second thing is that they would start to become reckless. They will start to lash out. They will start to become violent. That's the second possibility. The third possibility is that they will have reliance upon those who they consider to be their enemies and throw themselves in their arms. So those are the three main issues, three main possibilities of anyone who is facing these kind of pressures. Surah Hud, it comes with balance. It addresses each of those phenomena that have been mentioned. Losing hope, becoming reckless, and inclining towards the enemies. And what has, and the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is that many a times when he mentions a story, what did I say? He comments on it and gives the, uh, and he gives the moral of the story. So rather than just beginning from the, begin, beginning from the, uh, the first few verses, I want to end, I want to begin with the last verses of the chapter, which is chapter, uh, which is, Verses 112 to 113. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكَ So remain on a right course as you have been commanded, and those who have turned back with you to Allah, and do not transgress, indeed he is seeing what you do. And do not incline toward those who do wrong, lest you be touched by the fire, and you would not have other than Allah as protectors, then you would not be hurt. So this is the conclusion 
of Surah Tur, where it mentions after all of the story that are in it, the moral. This is the great lesson that has to be taken. So let's break this sort, these, these two verses down into the lessons that we can derive from it. The first thing, what did I mention first of all regarding the three possible, possible, possible reactions to a society or a community that is pressurized? The first thing I mentioned, that's the second thing. Losing hope. The first thing is losing hope. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in these verses, the first thing that we can do in order not to lose hope is astakim. Be steadfast. Persevere in this divine mission that you are upon. You are a people of Islam. You are don't lose hope. With Islam, with this call, you may face some difficulties. So persevere. But stop him. Be steadfast. The second thing that we mentioned that a group of people would do is what? The first one is lose hope. The second thing was fight. to fight. Be reckless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses says, Wala Avoid transgression. Don't be reckless. Don't be violent. And what's the third thing that we mentioned? Sorry? You can't beat them, join them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which means avoid inclination. Don't throw yourselves in the arms of the enemies. Don't be like them. Don't blindly imitate them. So all of these things have been mentioned in this surah. This is why Hassan al Basri, he had a great saying regarding these verses or these, this surah. He says, Glory be to those who made a balance. Glory be to the, to the one who made balance between the two do nots. Don't transgress and don't incline towards them. And these are things that we can use in our life. We can, these are things that we can use in our time. Because we are, in some respects, it's not fully, but we are uh, facing some aspects of the Madani period. There are parts of our time that we are, uh, that we are in the uh, Madani period, and there's some aspects of our life which, is, uh, which we can take lessons from the Makki period as well. Makki period as well. So these are the three main things. Don't transgress, don't incline towards them, and be uh, steadfast. So let's look at the surah from the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins his surah in a very similar way as Surah Yunus, where he says, describes the book as being wise. Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun Uhkimat Ayatuhu Thumma Fusilat Min Ladun Hakimin Khabir. Alif Lam Ra, this is the book whose verses are perfected and then presented in detail from one who is wise and acquainted. Very similar to the way that Surah Yunus was, uh, what, uh, began, with the concept of the book being wise. But there is a different type of wisdom that is mentioned. In Surah Yunus, the wisdom that is attached is the wisdom that is related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Surah Hud, the wisdom that is connected is connected to his book. Both of which help the Muslims to deal with their problems and difficulties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the meaning of determination, of balance in calling people to Allah. He says in the second verse, Allah ta'budu illallah innani lakum minhu nadirun bashir. 
through a messenger saying, Do not worship except Allah, and if I am to you from him a warner and a bringer of glad, uh, of glad good tidings. So when you call people, you do it with balance. You tell them, you warn them, you also bring them good tidings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the seventh verse, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ فِي سِكْتَةِ أَيَامٍ And it is He who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now what is the relationship between the creation of the heavens and the earth in six days with the atmosphere or the siyah and the context of the verses which are in this surah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how to preach, how to call people in these verses. So what is the connection? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have easily created the heavens and the earth in one day. With a blink of an eye. Straight away. Kun But he didn't. He wanted to teach us how to do things gradually. So we learn how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth over a period of time. Just like when we give da'wah, we do it over a period of time. There's a really beautiful story of uh, Shaykh al Mubal, rahimahullah, and this, out of all the contemporary scholars, he seems to have the greatest and the best stories, rahimahullah. And he said that I was giving da'wah to this individual, and it's only until the 104th time, I think he mentioned, that he changed. He counted the number of times he's giving da'wah. And he says it only changed only after the 100 and so and so number. So this is the concept. Things don't happen in one go. It happens with the double. Gradually. In verse 11 it points to the same meaning. Uh, no, it, it, uh, in, the, in, in the verse 11 Allah subhanahu wa says Uh, no, no, we'll have to leave that actually. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions uh, a number of verses after this, the examples of people who persevered. Who, and, and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned a number of uh, prophets. Uh, we covered a surah and it mentioned five stories. What surah was this? Surat A'raf, yeah. So example, uh, Nuh, Thud, uh, Lut, uh, Salih, and Shu'ayn, yeah. So five prophets were mentioned. Likewise, five prophets are mentioned in this surah as well, in, 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 this, in these verses. The first one is Nuh, Thud, Salih, Shu'ayn, and Musa, alayhi salam. And they are focusing, the reason why they're still going to be mentioning is because they are focusing on the Prophet's application of these three things. On the application of these three things. What are these three things? Being steadfast, avoiding recklessness, and not inclining towards them. So you'll find a beautiful pattern for each of the Five prophets mentioned in this, surah, in this surah, and how they're calling their people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under these circumstances. And what is interesting is that it ends with Musa al It ends with Musa al Why? What's, what's so interesting about that? Because the concept of jihad, for the first prophet to come with jihad, was Musa al and so all of these all of these prophets that are mentioned are from the earlier generations of the history of mankind. So Nuh an ample example, a man, a great man, alayhi salam, who called his people for how many years? How many years? Nine hundred fifty.
So let's go over some of the verses related to Nuh He says, Allah subhanahu wa says in verse 25 to 26. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا اللَّهِ إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ أَلِيمٌ And we had certainly said uh, Nuh to his people, saying, Indeed, I am to you a clear warner, and that you do not, uh, and that you do not worship except Allah. Indeed, I fear for you the punishment of a painful day. So the words that Nuh used are the very same words that I mentioned uh, earlier on. In the, I think it was in the second, second or third verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is no one who is worthy of worship and that you are bringing Nabir and Bashir uh, together. You're bringing warnings and glad tidings together. Very similar uh, to how Nuh was speaking. But the message is the same, the mission is the same, the conditions that the prophets faced are also the same. And therefore the results and the way that you encourage people to deal with these problems is the very same one. So let's go over that. Let's go over the example. So the first thing, in verse 32, we find that Nuh is telling his people or persisting. He is steadfast. They said, oh Nuh, you have disputed us have been frequent in dispute of us. So bring us what you threaten us if you should be of the truth. Who would ask for the punishment to come upon them if it isn't for a people who have been called over and over and over again and they just being annoyed and agitated by the prophet? This shows us that Musa salam, is calling his people under these difficult circumstances. He is not good. He's not getting bored of calling people to Allah. There's very few people at his time. He's the second, or the, the very second or third prophet the, of the ones that we know. And he's addressing the same people. There cannot be many people at his time. A few hundred maybe or something like that. Allah, Allah knows best. And he's going to each and every one of them calling them to Islam, he's not getting bored for 950 years because sometimes we get bored with certain aspects of Ibadah, unfortunately. But he is persistent, carrying on over and over again. This tells us about the first thing that we need to do and the message of the Surah is being steadfast. So the second thing that we mentioned is what? Not to be reckless. Where is this? If you were in the same situation and you were told to bring the punishment, what would we do? Maybe we would beat that person up, we would get frustrated, we would become really, really angry, so on and so forth. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about? In verse 33 and 34, he said, Allah will only bring it to you if he wills, and you will not cause him failure. And my advice will not will not benefit you, although I wished to advise you if Allah should intend to put you in error, he is your Lord, and to him you will be returned. He didn't fight back. This is not the time for fighting. He wasn't instructed to fight, so he didn't fight. He wasn't reckless, he was very wise in what he said, and that was that Allah will deal with you if he wants to deal with you. If he wants to bring the punishment, he will bring the punishment. This is up to him. And even the manner that he did it, he did it in a very gentle tone. He wasn't very aggressive in the way that he said it. He even, it's almost as though he said, but I don't have a problem with you. The only problem I really have with you is the fact that you're not worshipping Allah, but I personally don't have a problem with you. And Allah is the one who's going to bring the punishment upon you. And it is at this point, from all the stories of Nuh which are mentioned in the Quran, we learn about the building of the ark or the big boat. In verse 37, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him. 
and construct the ship under our observation and our inspiration, and do not address me concerning those who have wronged. In they, indeed, they are to be drowned. So, Nuh salam, he is building this ship for many years. And he lives in the desert. You have to imagine, a person living in the desert, he, what does he need to build the ship? He needs to build, he needs to have trees and plants, so on and so forth. Maybe it was many years. He was waiting for the trees to grow, for him to cut them down and then make, use that material to build the ship. So we don't know the number of years it took him to build the ark. But even during that whole time, he's been ridiculed. His people are saying what is customary for the people of the Prophet, unfortunately. That you are a madman, what are you doing? Why are you building a ship in the middle of a desert? And so on and so forth. But he showed perseverance, he did not fight back. And these are the two of the three things that we learned from him, at least from Surah Tuh, the third one is going to be coming uh, shortly as well. For those of you, without reading ahead, the third thing is what? So two things already happened to Nuh Salam. He showed perseverance. He's been calling his people to Islam for 950 years. He hasn't showed recklessness. In fact, he's actually had a very gentle turn. He hasn't fought back. What's the third thing that we mentioned? Yeah, you don't incline towards women. Without looking at the verses that come after this, from the story of Nuh that you're familiar with, that you know that is in the Quran, where would this inclination, where, would, where, where does this happen in the lifetime of Nuh his son was promoted. Excellent. Very good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the, the verses that come after this, Again, the word concept of being wise comes up over and over again. Nuh salam says, called to his Lord and said, My Lord, indeed my son is here of my family. And indeed, your promise is true, and you are the most judge of judges. This is the third thing. Do not incline to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in verse 46. He said, O oh Lord, indeed he is not of your family. Indeed, he is one whose work was other than righteous. He was very solid. So ask me not for that about which you have no knowledge. Indeed, I advise you, lest you be among the ignorant. Verse 46. And then what does, so we find that those three things, or the lessons that we take from Surah uh, Thud, are mentioned in the story of Nuh quite clearly. As a result of this Nuh he sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the following, the next verse, he says, Nuh said, my Lord, I seek refuge in you from asking that of which I have no knowledge. And unless you forgive me and have mercy upon me, I will be among the losers. SubhanAllah, the reaction of Nuh salam, even though that was his son, he cut him loose because this is what Allah wanted him to do. And the emotional bond that we may have with our children is not like the bond that Nuh would have with his son. Why? Because your child that you have with you, your son or your daughter that you have this close bond with, this relationship that you have, how long will it last? Maybe 60, 70 years. This is a relationship of Nuh with his son over hundreds of years. And yet he had to cut him loose. Because Allah told him that he is not from your family. So this, this is a huge sacrifice. It's not something which is easy.
And all of these stories, if you look at the story of Shu'aib, of Salih, of Lut, of Hud, they have the same meaning and they represent those uh, applications that have been um, mentioned in the surah. And that is to be steadfast, to not transgress, and not to incline toward those who, toward those who do wrong. So let's look at another example of, story, of the story of Shu'aib uh, alayhi salam. He said in verse 88, an example of him showing steadfastness, I only, I only intend reform as much as I am able. So his people, the struggles that he was going through with his people was related to monetary economic dealings. And he said that I only intend to reform as much as I am able to. It's clear that they are getting agitated with him and he has to say it in this way. The severity of the situation was that they even accused him of lying. They said, Oh Shu'ay, we do not understand much of what you say and indeed we consider you among us as weak. And if, and if it was not for your family, we would have stoned you to death. This is what they are saying to Shu'aib alayhi salam. So what would he do in this situation? What would a normal person do in this situation? You may fight back. You may retort. But this is the second thing. He did not act recklessly. And he responded. He said, oh my people, is my family more respected for power by you than Allah? Same style of Nuh He said, I'm going to leave this with Allah. I'm not going to respond. Just like when Nuh said, Allah is going to bring the punishment upon you. This is between you and Allah now. Same thing. He's saying, do you think you're, you're more powerful, my family is more powerful than Allah? Think about him. But the point is, is that he didn't uh, act in a reckless manner. And this is not what we expect from the prophets anyway. And in contrast, avoiding getting inclined, the third thing that was mentioned. He didn't flatter them. He didn't, you know, uh, do any of these things. In verse 93, he said, Oh my people, work according to your position. Indeed, I am working. And then he says, in, uh, and this continues in 94. And then he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the translation of what is, And when al command came, we say Shu'aib and those who believe with him. So this is clear that he did not incline, and not that we would expect his followers or himself to incline towards the, uh, the those who do wrong. So we come to the stage where we ask, why is this surah called surah Tawd? From all, in actual fact, the story of Nuh is longer than the story of Hud, even though we didn't even go over the story of Hud. And the reason for this is because from the different types of punishment that were mentioned from these prophets, Hud is the punishment upon his people was considered to be of the worst. One of the worst. And his, these three things which were mentioned regarding remaining steadfast and avoiding recklessness and not inclining, this was more applicable to him as it were for the other stories. So here we find a beautiful uh, instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this time where the believers and the Prophet وسلم, would want to fight back. But this is when jihad was not allowed. Jihad was not allowed in this situation. And 
the end of the chapter, it ends with what I began, which is verse 112 to 13. These two verses, the moral of the story. So remain on the right course as you have been commanded, and those who have turned back with you to Allah, and do not transgress. Indeed, he is seeing of what you do. And do not incline towards those who do wrong, lest you be touched by the fire, and you would not have other than Allah as protectors, and you would not be helped. So someone may ask us, what can I do in order to fulfill these three orders? What would help me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly after these verses says, وَأَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفِ النَّهَارِ وَزُرُفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَ لِلْذَاكِرِينَ And establish the prayer at the two ends of the day and at the approach of the night. Indeed, good deeds do away with misdeeds. This is a reminder for those who remember. So these are the ways that a person, and be patient for indeed Allah does not allow to, uh, of, the, of those who uh, allow the reward to be lost of those who do good. So these are the ways that a person can fulfill or help, it will help them to fulfill these three things. To pray, to establish the, 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 the part, uh, establish the salah which will help him in being able to work, to reform, to call the people to Islam. What we'll look at now very briefly is the next chapter, Surah Yusuf. And Surah Yusuf, it comes one of the questions. What well, did you say that? Uh, the manner in which the punishment uh, happened. That's what they say. Uh, as, as was mentioned, Surah Yusuf, it comes after Surah Hud, not only in the order of the Quran, the order in Revelation, when the Messenger of Allah received this in Makkah, it came after Surah Hud. And it consists of 111 verses. It is the longest surah of the Quran that mentions one story of a prophet. And the beautiful thing about the surah is it doesn't matter what person or what type of person you are in terms of your Islam, you are able to read this surah and extract the benefits that are not so obvious. You could be a great scholar, you could be a person who has just started to commit to his deen and Surah Yusuf comes as a comfort and it uh, is something that many people can relate to. It has many elements of what can be considered to be uh, the greatest of stories. It has love, it has suspense, it has the image of depiction, it has a lot of symbolism, there's a beautiful logical uh, sequence. And just to give you an example of the logical sequence that we find in Surah Yusuf, is that the Surah can be divided into 12 parts. We will, I'll mention six of those parts, and then six of the other parts you can work out for yourself. It's very easy. The surah is like, is if you put a mirror in, mirror in the middle of the surah, what is in the first half of the surah, not literally the first half, in terms of the number of verses, but in terms of the content, we find six things happen. The first thing is what? How does the story begin? With a dream. Excellent. It starts with the story of a dream. Then what happens after this? Sorry? 
the brothers, they throw him down the well. Or we can say, even before this, and it includes the well, there's a confrontation with the brothers. Right? And then after this, what, what, what happens? Sorry? Honey. The wife of the Aziz, what about her? Yeah, she's trying to seduce Yusuf. That's the third thing. The wife of the Aziz tries to seduce Yusuf. Then what happens is that who else tries to seduce him? The women of the town. The other powerful women of the town, they try to seduce him. What happens after this? He's thrown into prison. That's five things so far. Okay? What's the sixth thing? In, in sequence, in sequence. The dream of who? The dream of the king. Excellent. The dream of the king happens. So those six things in this sequence that occur, the first half of Surah Yusuf, Surah Yusuf, they happen in the reverse order. So what happens after the dream of the king occurs? He interprets that dream. We said that the fifth thing is that he was, he was put into, thrown into jail. What happens? He comes out of jail. And he refuses to come out of jail until the women... He says, what happened to those women who cut their hands? They say, no, it wasn't Yusuf's fault, it was our fault. We would try to seduce him, it wasn't, it wasn't the other way around. And when this came about, then the wife of the Aziz, she came clean. And she said, no, it was my fault. After this, the confrontation of the brothers that happened in the mid beginning of the surah, they seek Yusuf alayhi forgiveness and he forgives them, and then the dream is actualized by all of them making sujood and his father Ya'qub alayhi salam making sujood. This is the beauty of the story in terms of the logical sequence. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this surah by saying, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ That we relate to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the best of stories and what we have revealed to you of this Qur'an. But what did I say? I said, that after a story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the comments. But we tend to find the moral of the story toward the end of the surah, the end of the of, of that story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't come, didn't mention this story just to tell us something which is entertaining. It has a purpose. And this purpose is found at the end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> Indeed, he who fears Allah and is patient, then indeed Allah does not allow to be the lost reward of those who do good. Verse 19. The chapter tells us about Allah's plan, not necessarily perceived by our minds. So, one of the important aims of the surah is to trust in Allah's plans, don't lose patience, don't lose hope. Because the incidents that happened to Yusuf are something which are very strange. Because the consequences, they don't really match up the expectations that we would anticipate. So for instance, the love of Ya'qub alayhi salam for his son Yusuf, though it brought good, though it is good in and of itself, it had a bad consequence, which was it brought the wrath and the jealousy of his brothers. When Yusuf alayhi salam was thrown into the well, this is something which is bad in and of itself. But it led to something which is good and that he was picked up, eventually taken and brought 
by the uh, the Aziz, the uh, minister of that country. And from all the people that he could have been bought by, he was bought by one of the most powerful people in the country, and the most influential and the most rich, which is a good thing in and of itself, but it turned to something which is bad, that led to, the, led, uh, to his wife wanting to seduce Yusuf Alayhi which led to something which is also bad, which is prison. But even though this is something bad in and of itself, it led to some good, because then he was sent to help the ruler. So one of the main messages of the surah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know. Even though there are things which we think are good for us, they may be bad. And there are things in our life which we think are bad for us, and they may end up being good. So even if we look, and assess the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. We can say there are three peaks, three points which are good and two points which are quite low. The peaks or the things which are good within the story of Yusuf alayhi salam are what? I mentioned some of them. So example, the love of his father. This is a good thing. Tell me another good thing. Sorry? Uh, no, uh, those, that is good. That is good. But from the things that I mentioned, is that he spent, he was the slave in the house of the minister. This is from all the master people that could have bought him. He was bought by this person. And the final thing is that he himself had eventually become the minister or one of the main important rulers of the country. And the two low points, we can say, is that he was thrown into the well and he was thrown into prison. There's many parallels in the story. Well, like there's so much to talk about related to Surah Yusuf. But it's very difficult. So example, we can say that when he was thrown into similar situations, the opposite would happen. So when he was thrown into the well, he became a slave. When he was thrown into prison, when he came out, he became a ruler. So there's, we find that there's similar things that occurred, but the opposite results happened. Slave, ruler. But they were thrown into things which were not good for him. Now the difficult time that Yusuf a.s. had, it varied including the well and including the prison. But if I were to ask you a question, which one from these two was worse? Was thrown, being thrown into the well worse or being thrown into the prison worse? Which one? Some say prison, some say well. How many people think it's well for your hand up? How many think it's the prison? Only one or two for the prison, most say well. I'd say it's the well. Why? Because first of all, there's a number of reasons. The first reason is Yusuf alayhi salam was a young boy when he was thrown into the well. At least with being thrown into the prison, he was an adult. The second thing is that he does not know when he's going to come out of the well. He may die in the well because he's been deprived of food and drink. In the prison, he's been fed. There is a possibility of him coming out. Maybe some of the person who he told one of the, he interpreted one of the dreams of, will go and mention him to his ruler, and so he'll come out at some point. There's some hope. There's no hope in the world. So in terms of duration, what is interesting is that 
In terms of duration, the amount of time that he spent in the prison and the amount of time that he spent in the well is very different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah knows best. And I'm just throwing these figures out just to show a contrast. And I'm not saying that these are the correct figures. But some scholars, they say that he was in the... And even in terms of if you work it out, it may be incorrect. So please bear this in mind when I mention these numbers. Some say that he was only in the well for three days. And others, they say that he was in the well, in the prison for nine years. So, the point of mentioning this is even a small time can be the most difficult period of your life. But when you are enduring a lot of hardship, and it may be for a very long period of time, it may be easier to deal with. Yusuf salam, he had passed through many difficulties and obviously we can learn from many of those things that he went through. And the chapter points out, as I've alluded to, that life is a mix of good times and it's a mix of bad times. And in both of those times, whether it's the good that you experience, the bad or evil that you experience, they are both tests. But the point in both of these situations is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in both in good and in bad. And trying to bring this back to the seerah of the Prophet we find many uh, parallels. Just like Yusuf was away from his father for a long period of time, he has effectively lost his father. But at some point in the future, he will meet them. That was the same case with the Messenger of Allah who had, when this surah was revealed, had recently lost his wife and his shelter, his uncle Abu Bali. Just like when Yusuf salam, was taken from his home, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu had to immigrate to Medina two years after this surah was revealed around two or three years. So the chapter helps to prepare the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for the hardships that will come. And this is why some of the scholars, they say that no burdened soul reads this chapter except they are comforted by it. Because it gives you hope and one of the reasons why we are able to relate to the story of Yusuf is that he went through ordinary things, very human things, that perhaps we have gone through ourselves. And this is the reason why there isn't a huge emphasis on the concept of miracles in the story. It's not very clear. What is the miracle of Yusuf in the story? But this is a miracle, something which has become impossible. Something that is impossible becomes possible. Yeah, so the splitting of the moon, each of these things. There may be some elements, maybe there is a small thing that he was able, even some people may say, but what about his ability to interpret dreams, so other people can interpret dreams as well. What makes Yusuf al Islam so unique? Um, it's very difficult to say there is one thing. The only thing maybe is the shirt. That the, the shirt was thrown at his, the, the, at his father, Yaqub al Islam, and then he was able to see. Perhaps this is the only thing. And the dream, he saw the dream that the moon and sun was uh, portraying him. But that's not a miracle though. 
A miracle is something which only the prophets can come with. Even there are human beings who come up with karamats, which yeah. are types of miracles. Yeah, they have this power with the drop. The drop. That's just very good management skills. They're not miracles. Uh, any human being could do those things, right? So there's a very human element to Yusuf al Islam which is emphasized in the Surah. Yeah. Okay, so there's a question regarding sujood. Why is sujood made? Because there are different types of sujood, and uh, one of the sujood that is that a person can do is sujood of shukr. Yeah, you may find the Algerian football team making this, right? <laughs> and the ones who actually, um, many footballers doing this as well. Okay, and the one who revived this was the Pakistani cricket team. Okay, they're the one who revived this sort of books, personalities. And it's a really powerful image. You know, it's really amazing dawah tool that they can they use for the kuffar to see what they're doing. Before these things would happen, they would uh, as one of my relatives said, they would they, they, the kuffar probably thought that why are they kissing the ground? You know, now they realize that this is a, 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 an act of worship. So there's a type of uh, sujood which is called sujood the shukr, shukr and you're in, in the previous sharia a person was allowed to make sujood to a person. Even the Prophet said this in the hadith, he said, if this, uh, when Mu'ad he prostrated to the Prophet having seen the followers of Caesar and other nations, the followers of other nations doing this to their kings, the Prophet, uh, he, Mu'ad did this to the Prophet and the Prophet said, don't do this, it's not allowed in our Sharia. And if there's anyone that I would allow this for, was for the wife to do this to her husband because of what he has done for her. Yeah. So it's not allowed in our Sharia, but it was allowed in previous Sharia. So this is one of the reasons why the prostration was allowed. But just to mention a couple of more points, is we see in the story of Yusuf Islam very much a person we can relate to because he's like a, a human being facing hardships that anyone could, uh, could, uh, could uh, go through. But it is his faith, his iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that carried him through. And the verses they bring about, and the surah as a whole bring about a lot of hope. You know, and this is uh, one of the great benefits that we can take from the surah. And, um, and uh, wait, we'll, we'll stop here inshallah. Uh, that the, uh, and then inshallah in the next session. Uh, we'll go over uh, Surah Ba'ad and Ibrahim inshallah. So we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, so we'll resume at quarter past three. Exactly what they should find for the month. I forgot any questions before we take a break. What's the miracle that you mentioned? Of Yusuf Lakhim. I said I don't know. Why? Yeah. 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 Any questions? So how you have it? Alhamdulillah, you ain't asking people questions. Uh, oh yeah, so we'll stop here.